Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview another legendary Kaggler Grandmaster, Mark Landry. In this interview, we talk all about Mark's journey into machine learning, how he got interested in machine learning, how did he discover Kaggle, his addiction for Kaggle, how his approach on Kaggle has evolved over all of these years that he's been active on the platform. we talk about his journey at sto he's been at sto.ai for a few years now we also talk about auto ml we reveal a interesting story auto ml at sto.ai was originally called auto mark landry that's another story that we uncover in this episode and there's a lot of discussion around data science on and off kaggle how to approach kaggle or data science problems broadly speaking i usually put a three word or four word title in the description of a podcast this one is all about data science kaggle and sto.ai but it's true to the three words we talk all about these three words and mark's journey in all of these three so i hope you enjoy the conversation as much as i did a quick reminder for the non native english speaking audience please remember to enable the subtitles on youtube for a better watching experience without further ado here's my conversation with grandmaster mark landry please enjoy the show Hi everyone today i have a great maker the og data scientist at sto.ai not my words for the record grandmaster mark landry thank you so much for joining me on the chai time data science podcast oh thanks so much yeah it's a pleasure being here i've listened to uh, several of yours in the past so it's an honor the honor is mine really excited to be talking to you but i i want to start by talking about your background uh, you did your bachelor's in computer science and have worked across different roles when did machine learning first come into the picture when did you find your passion for the field yeah um really the 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 machine learning i think kind of the, some of the the seeds started back then um i did actually do it with the term data mining that was kind of one of the interest when i did the computer science and so it was a lot of programming classes but i took an ai class i took a you know some database classes you couldn't do much in undergraduate uh, really at that <laughs> level um but i did what i could i thought and so um but then went straight out and to work in the field and wound up doing business intelligence data warehousing and so it kind of just stayed a little bit of a seed there so i had seen a little bit of it um but you just don't get that much i had a couple books i would read them every now and then but it was years um before it finally came together and um the the story part of it that i used to tell people um when i had my now older son who's now 8 um uh he wouldn't go to sleep and i was watching a lot of sports videos um so i i would i would take him at night and uh all night long my wife let her sleep and i would just hold him and after kind of wasting a couple months of doing this uh i started watching a lot of data science videos and so okay. started kind of following along with some of the online courses that were coming out you know stanford was doing theirs some of the moocs were coming alive but actually i was a really low tech one i really liked from from stanford actually it was a uh, co-taught with uh, google Uh, and it was really approachable and i didn't know anything about r at the time and so um just all a whirlwind sort of came together i started going to an r meetup uh, i met some people there and that moved me along to where i wanted to go seek a job in data science um and eventually oddly enough at my current company so i've been there probably about 7 years by this point maybe 6 7 years um uh, was doing um 
So they created a department to actually start to pursue this. So um, we didn't have that capacity. And so, and all this came together in the span of just, you know, two to four months, something like that. I don't even remember the timeline myself, okay. but it was really quick. And and that led to Kaggle. So so once people heard, hey, isn't this what you're doing? Like you're doing this analytics <laughs> thing. And I was like, oh no, I'm, you know, I'm just barely learning. You know, I'm just trying to get by. Uh, and, you know, it was it's one of these kind of three things. So it was about the third time someone asked me, um, if I was doing it, or the third real thing was was going to a meetup with someone who was at the time ranked fifth in all of Kaggle. Uh, he just showed up to the Austin Arm meetup, and it was a talk about Random Forest, and he was polite, and at the end, he just said, well, that's all nice and good, but all the cool kids are doing GBM these days. So, oh, what's that? <laughs> um, and it's just, you know, two nights later, I think I made my first Kaggle submission, and that was easy, and it just really, then that became that drove the passion, I think. So, you know, I look at it a lot as problem solving and I feel like I did that even when doing business intelligence, reporting, all that kind of stuff. You know, you're, you're doing a lot of problem solving and kind of anywhere um, when you're writing code of any sort, really. Um, but yeah, it really got together um, about there. So it was, it was quite a while um, of doing other stuff where I wanted to do that. I said I wanted to do it, but I finally acted on that and, and it, it came through pretty quickly. So. Awesome. Talking about your Kaggle journey, uh, you've witnessed a few years on Kaggle. You've been active over a few years. Kaggle has evolved itself. I remember when you had joined, there was no grandmaster title. You became a master in, I think, around 2014. Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, a couple of years in. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how has your Kaggle journey been from your first medal to today? How has your approach and views on Kaggle evolved? I think, you know, I, I, I lucked out a little bit, um, you know, as I was saying, I, these seeds were planted that some of the first competitions I did, I did pretty well. And so there were, you know, in the metal world, you know, it was all kind of new to me and everything, but it was fun. You know, the, this competitive drive started coming out that was pretty dormant in me, but it was fun to rise up on the leaderboard and there's different ways to do that. And so, but the first couple of competitions I did were sort of reaffirming of some of these thoughts that when you read it in the books, you don't see everything outlined where you can really do a problem end to end. I think we've gotten better as the world. There's so many awesome notebooks that are out there now, but you know, there, that wasn't so prevalent back then. And uh, so seeing a couple of competitions with some starter code that now we see in kernels and in Kaggle and, and notebooks, um, you know, and, and the different ways they've done the sharing. But, you know, back then it was Kaggle producing their own stuff. And so it was really nice to see that. So it was kind of affirming of some of these ideas I had in the back of my head. And I latched onto those pretty well, actually. I think it was a data base script where I saw some of these features created. I said, yes, that makes sense. Um, and so Kaggle itself has evolved. It's gotten a lot harder. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, it, it is, you know, you, you see, you know, some of my early ones, I think I have, yeah, at one point I had one of like the second most silver medals or something like that. Um, but uh, there's a lot of silvers in that early time and, and, and bronzes and things like that. And they were really fun. And I, I think, you know, that part of Kaggle is still there. There's there's new competitions to do. I think that every time I did one, I would find something new. There's some new little new wrinkle that you have to discover and overcome, and uh, that's what's just really fun. And that's what's nice about Kaggle too. It, it, in the work world, you don't always get that kind of uh, churn through problems. You know, I mean, it's it's a grind in one sense. That you know, two to four months typically. Um, that's a long time to spend with a problem. But just the same, they're they're concurrently run many different competitions, and for those that can do it actively enough to learn something. There's always, it feels like there's always something to learn. Um, so obviously we've seen a shift towards deep learning competitions. You know, they were out there back then. Um, it was really interesting to see, um, you know, Jeff Hinton actually competed in a competition yeah. a long time ago, well, won it and uh, his team. Um, but, uh, but that wasn't even an image one. And so they've gotten more and more image related to the, you know, the current point. And that's good. You know, they're evolving. That's what's interesting, keeps it fresh. Um, but it's a very different world now, you know, so there's a bunch of us, maybe old timers that will, wait for another tagler one to come out and just like feast off of that a little bit. Um, so I think there's, there's ebbs and flows and it's a time thing as well. And so it's just, you know, a year ago about this time, I found a lot of time to do some, did pretty well. And then, you know, it goes dormant for a little while, but um, I think Kaggle's done really well of staying kind of the same, you know, they've gotten better that the crowdsourcing is amazing. And, you know, it's, yeah. and that's why it's really tough. In fact, that's the biggest thing I think why it's tough. They've, they've really got, you know, there's just momentum. There's a lot more users trying these things, particularly a tabular one. You're going to hit easy four or 5,000 if you have just a yeah. plain old tabular competition these days. And, um, and then the, the notebooks and kernels just makes sharing so easy. And, you know, you take it for what it is. You can leapfrog onto um, someone else's work and pretend, you know, you can fool yourself to think that you can get in the top 15% or something just by <laughs> hitting copy. But if you take it for what it really is, you know, you learn little bits here and there. Um, but that sharing has made some really powerful submissions. So um, you can go 
back to some older competitions five, seven years ago, no doubt. Take what we know now, take what's come about, XG Boost, you know, the late GBM for the tabular competitions, um, but, uh, and do really well at some of the older ones before that was even coming out. So. I was like knowing the tools was was part of it early on when I started. So that's why I think really just getting this the, a, a little bit of luck to fall onto GBM at the right time and and see the feature prep at the right time. I think that was a good combination. And so I know one of the AMAs was, was what's your favorite algorithm, but anybody's seen kind of the talks, it's definitely GBM, the, the, the general <laughs> purpose one. XG Boost and Light GBM are awesome uh, improvements on that. And we have, you know, Cat Boost and others too. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, GBM and its flavor is certainly my favorite. And I'm glad I looked onto that at the time I did and just kind of got a pretty good knack for using it early on. And you could do pretty well if you knew problem solving, you could get some features in there and use GBM. That was about all you needed back then. It felt like to, to do pretty well. Awesome. So uh, was your Kaggle addiction, if I may, because of the competitiveness or because of the learning factor, maybe a mix of both? Definitely, definitely a mix of both. Yeah, because I, I really, I, I, don't find myself being that competitive in any other place in life. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, I did sports, you know, playing, you know, but it wasn't really the competitive drive wasn't even there. It was to play for fun almost and to try to you know, do what it was. But um, now, yeah, the, comp the, the leaderboard is, is really addictive. Um, you know, it is. And yeah. so there's times, you know, it, it takes time to do well at one of these, you know, the strategy sometimes if I don't have much time, I can still have fun in a Kaggle competition. Even now you, I could look back and, um, you know, some somewhat embarrassing results, but that was what I was just trying at the time. I was like, okay, let me take this idea. I'm going to join seven day, you know, to eight days before the competition is over and just see what I can do. Of course, I'm not going to compete for the top, but you know, what little bit it is, this looks like a fun problem. I'll get my hands around the data and see if I can just kind of improve something here and there. And that's what I'm going to learn. So, you know, that kind of time that's, that's fun for me. And then just still rising up on the leaderboard and trying to um, almost nitpick, you know, sometimes those are not really sustaining things. You don't want to do those in industry so much, but there's little gamification almost things you can do yeah. um, of just, you know, curving your numbers a little bit and understanding the problem a little bit and exploiting this or that. Um, you know, there, there's a little bit of the competitive drive that gets in there. Um, but the learning, yeah, is, is definitely the, the more rewarding piece. And I think, I'm not sure how, when I really, I guess I realized that. So it was sort of early on, it was, gave me confidence, I suppose, that I was, I kind of understood this whole I, it was barely called data science, but, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, whatever you want to call it at that time. Um, yeah, I get it. Like, this makes sense. These supervised problems, it's just we've got learners that do that. And you can make these great features that almost solve the problem for yourself and then let the machine learning algorithm take over from there. And so, yeah, I think it gave me confidence of almost starting, not from scratch, really, but um, without a lot of the background that you see a lot of people have. And, you know, Kaggle's great for that, too. That's what I realized early on, too. We had people from all over the globe competing at Kaggle. We still do, but, you know, it was really exciting to see with the different countries that people are coming from. So I think Kaggle breaks down a lot of barriers, um, you know, maybe fake barriers, but uh, barriers nonetheless that to, for people getting interested. And then I realized, yeah, as um, I think what really hit me was that I was um, – doing an interview at one point um and uh and i realized i was talking everything i was talking about in that interview was about kaggle competitions okay. um you know i was there doing it for the real world i've been doing that job for about a year or so by that time um so i had some of that experience but the more relevant experience and the things you can really talk about you know is that the kaggle problems are there there's a lot of pain in <laughs> to do the real world stuff sometimes that doesn't really translate and doesn't show what you know you know it's usually one or two things but in kaggle you you can continue to just if you get a question interview you can kind of relate that to a kaggle competition when we started bringing on some of the uh you know some of the kagglers ourselves you know we would almost talk in terms of former kaggle problems you know dimitri and i would be like <laughs> oh yeah that, that one is you know it's like it's like roxman it has that kind of flavor to it it's that sort of thing and it's and it's it's true you almost feel like you don't want to do that you, you know i do real world data science and kaggle but you know kaggle is very much real world if you take it you got to take it with your right grain of salt and you know for what it is but there's a lot to learn there and so um yeah that learning part was is amazing and it's and it still is you know especially you know if, for where it's going with deep learning you know they're pushing the envelope on a lot of so many different things and the notebooks are just fantastic you can you don't even really have to join a competition but it's always more fun i think if you do um but to really absorb that code and see try to tweak something you know even if you're taking someone else's great work and if you really understand it you'll know the parts to tweak and to parts to get it better and when that doesn't get better you're going to learn something something so um, 
Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, all that, all that put together is what yeah, you're right to call it kind of an addiction. Uh, spent, <laughs> you know, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, you, one of our Kaggle Grandmaster panels, um, that question went around and it was almost embarrassing, you know, that everyone really said, yes, it takes a lot of time. I, I've admired some of those people. It feels like they, they, it comes to them a little quicker. Um, so there's a few people out there that seem to just drop in late in a competition immediately for a submission can get in at like 15th place or something like that. Like that's yeah. impressive. Um, but I think most of us, you know, it takes time. And uh, so. It's, it's also a lot of fun. Like Grandmaster Mario's mentioned it's to him. It's, it's sort of a game like addiction. Def- definitely fun. Also, not just, you're just overworking. It's, it's not just burnout, it's endless nights. Yeah, I think there's there's something there that that um, you know it wasn't necessarily competitive, but I think back, you know, I was not I'm not much of a gamer, but you know I would play these sports games on Super Nintendo, these old systems, um, <laughs> and I would play them just to keep up with the statistics. You know, I played this whole seasons full of baseball game, you know, hours and hours with one team and try to see if I could then beat those statistics with another team. And I would record it on paper and things like that. You know, it was like 14, 15 years old or something like that. And so, yeah, you know, and that was all fake and and you know, you gain nothing. And the really cool thing about Kaggle is you are learning the skills that can actually change the world. And, you know, and that's, that's exciting. Um, but Kaggle, yeah, really does play into some of that. The real world, sometimes it, uh, we should, we've tried to seek that sometimes it's hard to get in you know, real world Kaggle is real world, but you know, in, in actual professional data science, you know, you don't always get the same rewards there. There's no leaderboards. Yeah. There's no one to challenge against these things. So um, that's why that confidence is important. So if you know that you can consistently hit a leaderboard, um, you know, you'll, you'll feel more confident that you're doing the right thing when it's, it's all on you a lot of times um, out there. So, but yeah, I would agree with Marius on that. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned professional world and another aspect of uh, removing fake barriers. There's this uh, aspiration by Kaggle to transition into the industry by using Kaggle. You were already in the industry, then you found Kaggle. Did you find Kaggle useful for the real world uh, skills that you, you found? I mean, yes and no. So I guess to a little bit, it was frustrating. And so I think, again, it's that confidence to really put the right perspective. And so I was still new to it at that point. You know, I had this job because of this, this interest and I found Kaggle a few months later, I suppose. Um, And so, you know, it was weird. Really, I was giving this department with a fishing license. It was back when this target story about, um, you know, the the connection, target could identify, you know, new moms before sometimes uh, their parents. It was a kind of creepy story, uh, but it turned a lot of heads. It got a lot of executives thinking. And so at my own company, they had read that story. It's like, we want to be able to do that. Okay. Um, It's hard to do that. Um, You know, so we we sought out, it was a medical company at the time, or health insurance really, specifically. Um, And so, you know, we did what we could and paired up with some of these things, but it is hard to do, you know, to find the machine learning problems out there sometimes. You know, a lot of these problems, uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, can be solved with the mindset of machine learning, but maybe just simple business intelligence. Um, and so maybe that's, you know, a little bit of my background speaking, but when I had moved over to to Dell, there was a team member that was really curious. He knew I did some of these competitions and he, he said, I want to learn how, how to do this. Like, let's get away from it. Let's schedule some, a little bit of time here and there. And so I said, great, find a problem out there and let's just go take it on. And, you know, he did. And we, we talked about it a lot, you know, in, in quite a bit of detail. And then I said, you know, look, I just did a pivot table that shows there's nothing here. Like, you know, the pivot table showed me everything I need to know. Sure, we could throw a machine learning algorithm and get the last, you know, 1% or 0.1% on this. But the problem that we were, they were trying to solve, and this was an active problem, it's got a poor definition. There's nothing left. You know, it, it's been solved. Um, so in any case, it was a churn prediction. And the definition of churn at the time um, for a particular segment there was just too late. You know, they had already, um, they would wait to call it churn until after about four quarters. And nobody was coming back after three. And so I think that's the problem solving bit, you know, yeah, I can throw a machine learning algorithm at it, but studying the problem and seeing where it's at, you know, Excel showed me everything I really needed to know to know, wow, we need to change this problem altogether. You know, this is the wrong definition of churn. We need to, if you want to really act on this, you got to act faster. We got to change something here. So I didn't need a machine learning model to do that. I just needed, you know, a few hours with Excel. Um, so, and you know, everyone has their own EDA paths and things like that, but, um, yeah, th- those are, it's valuable. Um, and you learn that in Kaggle too, I think, you know, you can, you know, it's up to everybody what they take from it. Um, you know, you can just sit there and blend the models if that's, that's what makes you happy. Um, yeah. It's not what makes me happy and I'll lose a lot of times when that's the case. Um, so creating features, I think is where that comes in and almost these little mini models. Like I'm happiest if I have features that are nearly a model themselves and then I'll take the machine learning to, to get at that last extra bit. 
Um, so I think all that is is real world. So how does someone really get started? It sort of just bounced around that question. But um, yeah, I mean, picking it up, I th there's a lot to learn there. I think there's a lot to, to see. These are real problems, real data sets that you, a lot of people have a tough time um, coming into. You know, it's much harder. Uh, the data sets are big enough. Um, there are several legitimately big ones out there too. So I would say that's impressive. One big thing too, a barrier that I think a lot of people have is, and Kaggle's done great, uh, is just the small data, medium data, big data. There's, these aren't definitions, but you know, who, if you've done a lot of Kaggle competitions, you don't think twice about trying to get, you know, 250,000 rows or a million or something. It's just nothing. You know, your laptops can handle that. The tools can handle that to these days, all in memory. It's all fast. And so it's just, you know, whereas I think you go back 10 years and some cases there's probably people out there now that are just going to be a little scared once they cross a thousand rows or something nearly trivial, um, it, we would say uh, for doing these. So, there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, you know, the, the, the kernels are great. It's a great way to learn. Um, but I would say certainly competing and trying to figure out what you know and what you don't. That's the biggest, I think, asset of Kaggle is that it's a bit like school in that way. And it just keeps on coming is that, you know, you've got this project and you, know, you just can't, you, you can fool yourself, but you really can't fake what you know and what you don't know if you, if you just go and try. Go see where you stack up on the leaderboard. You know, you mm -hmm. may have hit on this grant great feature that lets you sit on everything, but you know, that's very unlikely. So um, I think that just continuing to do it too, because every one of these competitions is not going to teach you everything and they're yeah. all going to have their own little wrinkles. So you don't want to always be trying to optimize RMSE and think that they're <laughs> completely understand, you know, the whole robust regression and MAE and all that whole kind of stuff, but you could go a year without seeing competition like that. So there's always more out there. Um, so yeah, Kaggle's useful. I would say people pay attention to Kaggle results for sure. I've had some people trying to send stuff to me, like, you know, touting their 3000th, you know, place in a competition out of, you know, 5,000 or something like that. So I think, you know, I don't know where the recruiters are at as of catching that, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's realistic. Um, you know, if you be honest with yourself where, where things are at and could you do this, you know, um, when you're out there for a job, I think that's maybe one of the big things to think about is as you're doing this Kaggle kind of prepare yourself. If you get a job in, in most companies, not all of them, but most companies, you're going to be either solo or on a very small team that who's going to rely on you to do some things. So unless you get a great opportunity to learn from someone um, like an internship or something like that. And some of the, some of the companies are so big, they have giant departments and you can really can sit in there and learn from people and without too much pressure um, to, but uh, there's, there's no crowd for you to follow. There's no correction. Um, so many times I, I will still do it years in, you know, you're sitting on, like day one is was usually the most fun with a competition. And so you got this new data set, you're seeing where the leaderboard's at and your own model is telling you, your CV is telling you that, man, you know, this could be a first place submission. I'm onto something here, but you know, you know better. And so you drop that in. Um, and yeah, sure enough, you're down, you miss the boat, you know, you're at 80 percentile <laughs> or something like that. And so um, that correction doesn't happen when you're out there in the real world. So that's the one thing to, to be sure of that, um, you know, I think look at it and just really try to test yourself all the time and be honest with what you know and what you don't. The, the people who share afterwards, uh, you know, that stuff is great. I don't read those as much as I used to, but early on, every time you've done a competition and you've put all your effort into it, and then all of a sudden it's over and the top 10, you know, half of them are saying, this is what I did, this is what I did. And sometimes, you know, there's going to be some people who are going to do some things you didn't think about um, that are really just great and you can learn from that. And there's going to be some people that do what you thought you did and they just did it better, you know, and then you have to look at it. Like, Why did that, that was my idea. Why did it not work for me? You know, those kind yeah. of things. So that's the kind of learning. I think if you look at it with the right lens, um, you can really get a lot out of. Um, so unfortunately it takes about two months to get there <laughs> because these competitions <laughs> last a long time. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Um, Kaggle is awesome for, for learning, I would say. It's, it's also a humbling experience, like you mentioned. And I think you mentioned about this in a S2 world as well. Uh, you spend equal amount of time on the same problem as everyone else. And you realize the other person has done much better. And then you go back, do your homework, learn and come back for another competition. Yeah, that's, that's really, yeah, that's, that's a lot of what that, that early part was. And so there were some really, you know, I'm, there's, there's almost these eras of, of, of you know, of super cagglers almost so the people up at the top you know there were a lot of our users fortunately jiba was one of them um mm -hmm. you know he sort of grew to the top at that time so um you know but he was very active when when, when i was starting um and then several other really good ones were putting a lot of nice r code out there and so it was really good to see and yeah it, it almost amazed me how many times when you would look at that it wasn't that 
otherworldly what they had done. Um, there are a lot of really cool ones that is like, wow, you know, that is just impressive. There's no way I would have ever, um, you know, gotten there. Either it was a good idea or just some people just, they, they have the execution and the, the persistence to really, you know, go the, the extra mile or 10 miles it seems sometimes to really see that great feature and just grind the screws in and just keep it taking it further and further and further. Um, so, you know, there's some times I've been fortunate enough to latch onto something that I can do that and just keep with it for a while. But, you know, that part's hard and you say, ah, that is the idea, but man, that's a way better implementation of it or <laughs> it would have taken me so long to write that code to get that working the way they did. Um, so yeah, a lot to learn on those, those kind of things. But yeah, I think if you just sort of be honest with yourself about where you're at a lot of times, and I say that, I guess a lot, I've said this a lot in the last few minutes, but I've seen a lot of people who are not. I think a lot of people who look at some of these solutions and think they know it, and then, you know, I either teamed up with them or, or more just kind of just discussing things and, and they're sort of a little too passive about it. You know, you, you think, you know, you see that solution. Oh, it looks so easy. I can do that. You know, that's why actually getting in there and actually competing and not making excuses for yourself on, on why you're in the bottom half of the leaderboard. And, you know, there's stuff out there. And then, then there's something for everybody. Some people legitimately are like, yeah, I see what everyone else is doing, but this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to optimize GLM for this one. You know, it's not going to win, but this is what I want to do. That's great. You know, Kaggle, you, there's no pressure. There's really, it's nice in that there's really no pressure to have a bad finish. I feel like, you know, early on, I felt, you know, there are a couple of them where I was embarrassed uh, to like, oh my goodness, I finished in, you know, the 40th percentile or something like that. How could it, you know, in, but time is such a factor uh, on some of these things. You know, you have time and you can't even really count submissions. Sometimes you can just get in there and fire off five cheap submissions. It doesn't really just show how much time it is. So it does take time for most of us to, to do well. And if you don't have it, well, so what? You know, that's the thing. How easy is it to get into Kaggle? It's it's really easy. You know, you could just, just go submit all zeros if you want to. <laughs> you know, you're on the leaderboard and then you just go from there. I mean, you know, the mean is, it was kind of what would I say? That was the very first submission I had was uh, just, the average um, submission, and that got me to about halfway through. I was like, well, that was easy. It was just a CSV. That was, that's, that's nice and easy. Um, I could do better than that and just started doing some other things, and these, these concepts kind of gelled, and so and it was fun. And that, that, that was it. I was hooked on, I, as far as I can remember, day one or night one, really, I think, as it was. Um, yeah, because it's like, yeah, it was really approachable. So, okay. Kaggle should be that for some people. So. Do you have any favorite battle stories or any favorite competitions out of all of the huge number that you've competed in? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's these little little things about all of them, I guess. Um, and so, you know, it's fun to go solo on some of these, but most of them, the, my favorite experiences are as teams, certainly with SRK. I think there's... Um, you know, there are some of these aha moments, you know, SRK is just so much better at, uh, you know, it, it, at all the little pieces of modeling than I was. And so my, my contribution to a lot of those teams was just coming up with an interesting idea to try. Uh, often my implementations would be worse if we were doing the same things, you know, he's just great. Um, but yeah, there were these times and I just remember I have these, you know, we were communicating on GitHub with these GitHub issues, like kind of hijacking that to almost, there was not, we weren't doing Slack back then. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so late in one of the competitions that eventually we got a gold medal in and it, we have been doing this for I felt like a couple months or so and, and it's slowly creeping up the leaderboard and there are a lot of familiar faces in the leaderboard at that time too um, and it just felt like this aha moment and so I started to realize one of the little kinks in the, the, the competition we just hadn't been looking at one part of it right and it wasn't a super valuable part to do the problem you know overall so it wasn't really embarrassing that we missed it but I figured out, oh, this is what it was. And we jumped, finally reached into the top 10 when that happened. And so I feel like like those aha moments are kind of fun because I guess that's my personality doing these co competitions. I'm always in it sort of for the features and this explore, exploit. I'm always in favor of more exploring usually uh, for these sorts of things. I hate just, just okay, finally, I'm going to give up on my features because that's what it feels like. You don't have to do this. It can be a trade-off, explore, exploit. But um, you know, I feel like once I start to get into the hyperparameter tuning to quite a while, then I feel like I'm done. Like I, So I always feel like, I don't know, the, the, the extra feature that's what's going to difference and sometimes it is sometimes it's so but yeah that was the uh that was one of the competitions icdm if i get that right icml um mm -hmm. but uh, uh with srk and then rob from austin um and that was a fun one i suppose but there's a lot of those little moments that happen <laughs> in these competitions i mean being first for the first time that was exciting that was with uh, takura the data geek um 
uh, we, we teamed up. It was my first ever time to team up with somebody I didn't know personally uh, from Austin already. He just kind of reached out to me uh, early on. And um, so we worked pretty hard at that one and you know, just really started getting, it, getting things working. And uh, we had this really nice, you know, this beautiful trade-off. He was doing a regression. He was doing a classification model that fed into my regression model. Nice separation of duties, both doing some very similar tasks. And yeah, we, we finally got up into number one, I think at about two in the morning, wherever I was at that time. That was exciting. Like, oh, screenshot, like number one in a Kaggle competition is exciting. So um, that was that was a couple that stand out. And then I think the team part of it too, like just someone to share with <laughs> some of those things. Yeah, uh, that's nice as well. So. This is from the AMA. Any advice on how to win your first gold medal in Kaggle competitions? Oh man, yeah, so tough. <laughs> um, so that's yeah, because I feel like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, all I can really say is is what I am to some extent. You know, I'm, I'm sort of the feature person. So I mean, and, and I like, I mean, knowing GBM, knowing how to operate GBM, I used the R implementation for the longest time, um, before actually Boo started to get popular and started to be a huge user of H2O's GBM, and still am to this day. Um, but the early RGBM, I just sort of understood it at a pretty. It just came out a little bit natural, the idea of decision trees. So I think. Um, you, you definitely need to be familiar with the tool you got. Um, and so, you know, the tools now are, you, you, you see, you, know, you can have to ensemble at least, you know, your best GBM basic um, algorithms. If it's a tabular one, you know, deep learning, I'm not going to make too many comments on that because I'm not the authority on that for sure. You can see my <laughs> track record on that. You know, that's altogether different. So study up to do those kind of things. But um, yeah, if it's a tabular one, the, the gold medals, I guess I've earned, um, it, they are they are hard. Um, and so, you know, some of them are, um, it, I guess that just really understand the problem. You know, you'll see the same kind of way you set up. I think a lot of the ones that have, have fallen the right way for me would be ones where you understand your CV structure uh, a little better than some of the other people. And so there may be non-obvious uh, ways of cross-fold uh, validating some of the tougher problems, I think. And so, in fact, the reason I met Marios in SRK was uh, because of a post, um, you know, back in the rain competition where I was first for about half that competition. Um, and at H2O, we decided to share some of the information uh, in a meetup there. And so I gave Arno some content he could he could do, but wanted to stay compliant. So we made a post that did everything inside the Kaggle um, you know, rules there and said, okay, it was one of the tricks that, you know, I had two main tricks and I said, well, I can't give them both away, but here's this one. You know, I'm at this problem, I think a lot of people are not seeing the problem right. And so that was one of the keys for me to doing really well is that I just spent the time looking at that at the setup it was a very weird competition metric for a lot of people um, and uh, but it kind of became obvious when I looked at it but it took some time and so explore and really understand um, you know what are you doing how to how to it all feeds into how do we cross validate ourselves or just validate ourselves however whether you do folds or whatever it is that's a huge part of the problem um, particularly in industry too I think that's a really big part you know how does your test data look um, so how does Kaggle frame this problem so that I can do the same while doing my inner validation that kind of stuff that's a key part and then just yeah just trying to figure out I suppose what um, what the algorithms won't see by themselves and we have some of that that's that's you know target encoding has caught on in the last couple of years you know you could do really well if you understood target encoding um, maybe two years back or so, but now it's become um, pretty common uh, to be able to do that. So you have a kind of this mini model in itself. Um, but just, you know, whatever flavor of GBM, you know, you're using, um, they all are decision trees in the back of it. And decision trees are limitations. How can you overcome that? What can they see? What can't they see? That's a hard thing to describe. But, you know, if you understand the, the algorithm, and so maybe studying that a little bit and seeing, you know, what are people why are people changing this feature that way? You know, we think a lot of times feature engineering is this simple concept um, where we're just really trying to talk about whether we're one hot encoding or label encoding, you know, these features to present to them, you know, and that's part of it. Um, but really when you get deeper, um, there's just things that the algorithms can't see very well that would be obvious to you solving the problem, especially, you know, doing EDA and things like that. So I think exploring um, all the time and trying to figure out where the next, you know, the next thing to, to give the algorithm that might help and then understanding that it's, you know, you're going to fail a lot. You know, everyone almost says that, you know, there's, there's a lot of good ideas, a lot of great ideas. How can this not work? And then it just, it just doesn't, you know, the algorithm already had that or there just wasn't anything there. It's not, it looks nice and clean when you see it your way, but uh, you know, there's a whole lot of noise on the end of that and the algorithm can't use it. So, um, you know, some of that takes time, I suppose. I, think of it a lot as problem solving. So if you really take it from the basics sometimes, and that's, um, 
you know, I think you can get pretty far with that. You might uncover something in that phase that that helps you um, create features to go into some of these algorithms. But uh, that's that's most of what it's about. So, and and you see everyone, you know, all the people that are consistent about being in the top of the leaderboard, you know, almost day one is figure out what the cross validation strategy is. And so, really understand that, understand it well, because um, you can make more submissions to yourself than you can to the Kaggle leaderboard, and you don't want to overfit it too much anyway. So, you want to be have a nice, clean validation uh, process. So, that's important. If, if unfortunately you don't uh, join many competitions now, but if you were to become active in a competition today, uh, what would what be your uh, first go to steps when working on it? How would you approach the problem? Uh, I think, you know, to me, I guess everyone is sort of um, different. You know, I, I would, I, I get excited about the data sets and I can sometimes get excited about things that I almost know better. You know, you just, um, you're looking into it and you really see some meaty categorical features and like, oh yes, I've got this. And then, you know, well, the algorithm can see those too. So, um, but, uh, so I think I, I get excited about a lot of the data sets. I, I've, I've certainly downloaded far more data sets than I've actually participated in. Sometimes I don't even really get a competition, you know, a submission in. A lot of times I'll get just a few submissions in because it's just so fun to, to try some of these. You get into some, like some of the earthquake predictions, you know, I didn't have a particularly great finish in that one, but it was really fun to look at that data set and to really think. And that's another one too. If you step back and you look at that earthquake prediction, nobody knew what they were doing in that one. You know, the scores are all really bad if you really look at what we're trying to do um, of solving that problem. Um, and there's there's these higher level things going on. If you really look at well, the way that those earthquakes are, you had some that would last, you know, three times as long as the others. And these things matter. You know, understanding your data, I guess from the maybe old school statistician kind of standpoint, but really understanding the nature of your data, not just how the algorithms see it or how a lot of people do. You know, what are what problem are we solving and what are the things that make a difference in the way this problem might be solved? Um, you know, and your algorithms again, do a lot of that for you, but it still helps to kind of have that. So that's uh, spend some time with the data set. Um, you know, if, if it's also fun to sort of get in there early and, and get us some submissions in, it is kind of fun to be first <laughs> sometimes. I, I don't know how many I've done that for probably four or five, something like that. And that's kind mm -hmm. of fun, but eventually it'll fade unless you really have some, some traction on something. You're going to get that by usually putting more time into it. So um, yeah, for me, just looking at it, trying to study the problem, look, look like literally look at the data set, um, see what some of the things are, try some ideas, begin to get an understanding of that data set. That's always what's fun to me. So that would be my, that's my go-to on all these sorts of things, even you know, the Santander's and all those kind of things, just trying to, what are we solving? What would work? And, and, and developing a mental model, maybe. I guess that's that's the truly the, the go-to, studying the problem and developing a mental model of what I think would solve that problem so that I could illustrate that almost in words to somebody, whether I've tried an algorithm against it or not, you know, preferably even if I haven't. This is what I think. Because then you have this sort of way of, uh, you, you can gauge your expectations when a feature is a total miss. So I think the problem would be this way. It, it is or it isn't. And once, you, once your models are going forth and you see the feature importance or whatever it really is to see whatever your favorite way of trying to figure out how useful these features are, um, you're going to start to see some of those initial, that initial perception, it goes away. You know, it's, it's either wrong or it's just, oh, this problem isn't that way because they framed it this way. So you learn a lot of that by having, again, I think this sort of mental model of how you would solve the problem, what you think the problem, how the problems can be solved. Now, some of them are very difficult to do that. So, you know, they really do not necessarily require industry expertise, but it's just hard to understand the data sometimes. Um, but so I guess I prefer the ones where you, you, you sort of can't. Um, so I think one of the last ones that was sort of high up was a Microsoft uh, Mal malware one and time yeah. was a big deal and understanding all the way that they released the software and all of that. And so a lot of my model was really just um, trying to figure out um, how, um, how the data changed as new releases would come out and, and how you're, you know, a lot of people spent time on the timing of all that. Um, but I based a lot of my model um, based on some of that and what I had observed um, from the training set. And I felt like I understood that quite, quite a bit um, at, at that point. Uh, so that was, I guess I, I feel I feel in control, I guess, when I do that too. Even when sometimes your mental model doesn't really work out, or it's just blown away by the machine learning, you know, several <laughs> times it doesn't help you in the end. It feels like it doesn't help you in the end, but I think it probably always does to some extent. Okay. Now, uh, fortunately for Kaglers, there's one less person to compete with. You're not active as much. You're active. <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, there's a few sort of, yeah, that, that was a bit of, it, 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 it's a sore spot. I mean, I, I still love Kaggle. You know, SRK and I have had some of these discussions a little bit. It's like, you know, okay, you know, I was 33rd at one point and I'm not going to get back to that. And I've really probably the time to put in to, to get there. I've got the Grandmaster thing, you know, what left is there to achieve? You know, it's not, I'm not going to reach for number one. I'm just not that, not that good. <laughs> and so, um, but it's just so fun, I think. And so he was trying to say, well, yeah, get away from it a little bit. This is years ago. Um, but uh yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, I still want to do it. I still want to. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, learning deep learning better is something certainly that's that's something I can do with it. But I am sort of waiting for one of the tabular <laughs> ones to come out. And in the meantime, I think I, I, the competitive drive is still there. And so, you know, Kaggle is is certainly the main show. Um, but, you know, these, as I refer to them sometimes, like off Kaggle kind of um, competitions in an off Broadway kind of sense, um, you know, Analytics Vidya, Crowd Analytics, uh, Zindi is a recent one I've sort of seen. Um, and having fun doing those. And they all have different perspectives. You know, it's not Kaggle. You're not going to have the same kind of field to compete with, but um, but they're still fun. They, they've, there's a distribution of a leaderboard and well, it might be a little easier to hit the top in some of those. Um, it's it's still fun. And the difference, particularly with analytics video early on was that they would do them quickly. And so, you know, where I, I don't necessarily, I, I can't always find the time to, to grind it out for two months on a Kaggle competition. Um, you know, doing one in a weekend, like, ah, I can find the time for that one. And you can wait and for a few hours, you'll know if you have traction on that problem and you want to keep pursuing it or not. So that was kind of fun of, of doing some other ones. And I find that that, you know, really, um, that those those that first stage again it does come into that mental model getting your tools to execute what you think and and get a quick riser i guess is probably a little bit more of my personality in some of these um and so just hold on to the end while everyone else sort of catches up um and see if uh so with these short competitions, that's everything, you know, what can you do in a day? Um, you know, that's exciting. And so, and, and I found, you know, that that's usually the, the way I would start hiring people is that, you know, what you can do in two months is interesting, but standing on the shoulders of giants is sometimes hard to separate or standing shoulders of other people, at least I'm not sure what we say ourselves, but um, not me, but uh, you know, the Kaggle kernels, there's so much to build off of the ideas are out there. You know, a lot of that's just, it's just not going to, the positions I've been hiring for, what we need is someone who's confident in looking at a problem quickly and acting on that and really knowing what they can do and, and a diversity of approaches. So when you start to see people consistently um, hitting the leaderboard quickly before some of those ideas aren't out in, in analytics video, you can see that very quickly. Um, you know, all, it's what you can see all the time. So. Uh, that's where I spent some of the time. I feel almost embarrassed about that sometimes because, yeah, the Kaggle <laughs> ones are just so hard to do. But, um, you know, I participated here and there. So it'll come back. We have March Madness coming up pretty soon. So uh, I'll get involved with that one. Um, but, yeah, I do. do I've, the time is freed up. So my second son took a lot of that time away. Um, but uh, he's, he's, he sleeps a little more at night. So uh, <laughs> I'm ready to get back in. But, yeah, I'm not going to be quite, uh, quite what I was before. Coming to where you are currently solving uh, exciting challenges, H2O.ai, can you tell us what tasks are you working on and how does your Kaggle experience come into the picture? Sure. Yeah. Um, the the immediate stuff is pretty exciting as much as I say some of the, you know, the, the deep learning, um, you know, that those aren't my strong suit on Kaggle. You can clearly see that. Um, but, you know, I've learned a lot. We have Brandon on the team. So um, it's been great having Brandon on the team for your, for pushing four years now um you know it, and he's diverse in both sides you know he's excellent at uh, both sides of the problem he, and, and then kaggle keeps you current on, on a lot of you know the new models so um what we've been doing lately is using a variety of machine learning techniques to look at PDF documents. And this is coming in vogue. You can think of it as invoice reading. There's a lot of vendors doing that right now. Um, so we've got our kind of own brand of doing that, but um, we're doing it specifically for um, a, a, a different context. We have a different twist on that where it's not just straight up invoice reading. So we're doing, there's a few little bits of machine learning that come in here and there. And I think the part of Kaggle is that, that I guess, um, helps with directly this problem and certainly other problems we've done over time um, is is feeling confident again in, in how you approach a problem how do you break up the problem so we've got we've, we've approached this problem in three different ways um, and uh, trying to get your predictions out at the end of the day like sometimes a, you know picking up a Kaggle competition can be a lot of code to get from picking up the data set to actually a compliance submission and eventually those kernels will come out and you can borrow all that but you know if you really you 
those first few days, sometimes it can be like, oh my goodness, now I gotta do this, now I gotta do this, now I gotta do this. There's a lot of steps um, sometimes, you know, and, and, and if you're confident in coding, you can get through those pretty quickly usually, um, and maybe cut corners here and then put them back later. So, you know, that bit all comes together, I think, of just uh, of having this pipeline that's a bit difficult to see what all the pieces are. We have some sort of bizarre, you know, you don't just set a model loose on some of these invoice tasks. What we have to do is associate pieces together um, and they're not obvious. So we've tried some deep learning approaches that do it in image recognition, like segmentation models. And with that works some, in some cases, in some cases we have NLP models that do OCR and, and convert it more text mining. So there's diversity of models that are going in there, which is, is kind of fun. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of post-processing that comes in. You know, post-processing sometimes in some competitions is one of my favorite parts of doing is just tweaking the numbers a little bit to better fit the distribution. Okay, the model does this part. Now I'm gonna kind of take it further, but usually you've only written, you know, 10 lines of code um, to do that. Here, you know, we're writing a lot of code um, to sort of fix up every last little situation. So I think in this case, it, it's really paying attention to every little prediction um, to an extent that sometimes you don't get with Kaggle. I think that's what's fun with some of the March Madness ones is that there's only 63 games that get played. This is basketball for those that don't know that one. So um, you're predicting all the possible games that can happen, but only 63 are going to happen. And they happen very slowly. And you get a feel for, oh no, I hope Michigan State, just to pick a team, doesn't lose here because I'll go down. Or you know, you feel your predictions. Like, why did I predict this? Why am I predicting 92% that Loyola is going to win? That's ridiculous. Um, you know, oftentimes in machine learning, you're, you're issuing so many predictions. The downside of having, you know, it's so easy to get a quarter million, million, 10 million, 20 million records is you're just issuing 20 million things you know one here or there is off and you don't really feel that the, the pain of that so i think the problem we've got right now is, is we're just right there and so we're paying a lot of attention to how these models can fit together and, and things like that but um it, i think the kaggle experience is helpful for um sitting in position i guess is a part of what we do with the um, is, is to listen to the business needs. Um, you know, what do we want to do here? And what's that, is that possible with the data sets we have? You know, how can you contort that? So framing problems, you know, that's a really important part. Kaggle will do that for you. So again, if you don't have your blinders on, you'll realize that, you know, it, it, a lot of your work as, as a data scientist in the field is done for you by Kaggle. They do so much, they choose the metric, they choose the test sets. There's a lot of important things to learn there. You can make mistakes doing that. Um, you know, and, and, and for all the things that I know that, you know, occasionally they have some leakage things come out. It's a hard, it's a hard task. Um, but then setting up the problems, picking the data sets, picking a problem that makes sense, all that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of ideas that just don't make it past the concept phase because no, that just won't work, the timing of the data and that kind of stuff. So I think again, iterating through Kaggle, doing a lot of them, um, just give you again that, that frame of mind where you can see problems for what they are. If you think again of what these problems really are with the earthquake problem, what's the data we've got? What are they trying to solve? How does this target actually work out this way? Is this the, you know, the way it's really happening? You know, that those, those, that meant that understanding of the data set is pretty crucial. Um, certainly in, in how you, work as a practitioner because a lot of those problems are going to come at you and they're counting on your expertise of framing that problem. Um, so you want to be, be good at doing that and think of all the options, um, but also know when to say no to some of these things too. So. Okay. Now zooming out to your journey at S2, you've been uh, at S2 for a few years. How has your work evolved? You were already, already involved with the framework before you joined, you were very familiar with it. How, how has the journey been since? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know, I mentioned this a little bit on your, your podcast with him a couple months ago, or, um, you know, it, it was the African soil competition, and exactly like Arno says, so there were a lot of people, they were, you know, using that to, to show uh, H2O's neural nets, and, and so many people were following along. I was following along, David Paschke, who was working with me at the time, um, uh, was following, and now he's, he's with us at H2O, um, yeah, I'm, um we were following along. It was really cool to see neural nets on a CPU, like legitimately deep learning happening on a CPU, and H2O was making that happen in, in R, of all things, because you know, it's remote controlled, and so that was really cool. Um, and so when that competition finished, you know, I, I did pretty well, um, and and it was a lot about this framing of the problem. So and that was one of the things. So Arno had kind of messed uh, something up on that one. You had to treat a lot of samples in the same region all within a fold because that's how the test set was going to happen to you. So he would, you're accidentally leaking information a little bit when you don't do that. And so there's one of these conscious decisions you definitely have to make, um, you know, Kaggle makes it for you. Um, they didn't, they didn't make that clear, but you could figure it out if you looked at the data set. So um, that's where really paying attention, studying these things and really thinking about, um, and cause sometimes you can say, well, is this this way or is it not? And the data will tell you a lot of times or a submission will tell you, you know, look at it either way. Um, 
but uh, yes, yeah, so that one I reached out to Arno because it just seemed cool. You know, he was really actively participating. So was Joe Fai Chow, who's also now at H2O. Um, you know, but he wasn't <laughs> at the time. He was doing, I think, Domino. Um, and so there was this, this fusion was happening already. And I just sort of luckily got to, to, to help out with that. So um, yeah, I had no intention of really joining H2O when I just wanted to team up with Arno. That would be really cool to, to team up with, um, you know, a developer like that and really get into the, the framework and Arno's amazing. And um, so that was fun. And I remember just talking through one of the problems I was uh, on the weekend and cliff click um, like comments on one of my GitHub things I was just using as communication. I'm thinking I'm talking to Arno a little bit, but the whole team is watching what I'm saying, I guess. And cliff says, no, that's not how random forest works or something like that. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And cliff is the original CTO and wrote a lot of H2O3. And so it was like, whoa, you know, and, and, and um, so that was fun. Um, did that for, yeah, quite a while and eventually did join the team. So um, yeah, very familiar with it at that time, very much wanting to just kind of help out and try it. It was really neat to, for an R user, especially to really handle some of these data sizes. I really, the, the GBM was, was, you know, much better than what I had been using in R. And I think fortunately when I joined, we started to get it, catch it up to XG boost at that point, as I sort of put it. Um, so those were, those were sort of fun. So a lot of, um, the journey that for the first you know, half year or so, um, was you know some of it you know it was sort of billed as being you know competitive data scientist so i think what i have on linkedin is still i guess technically my job title um <laughs> i was doing kaggle competitions you know a lot more than i was prior to joining h2o so early on i was yeah definitely legitimately spending some of my eight to five not all of it but um some of it <laughs> so it's it's legitimate um so at doing that, that was fun, but, you know, trying to latch on to something at the time, it was a show so small, it didn't seem, you know, doing Kaggle full time was not really a reality, but what it really did, and that was, there was really fun, just as much as I said, like taking an interview and talking exclusively about Kaggle problems, the same was wound up um, being true talking to our clients, you know, prospective clients, just taking a call, um, you know, again, just having good problem solving ideas, understanding a problem, being able to jump in on some of those calls and listen to some of the data scientists or data engineers on the other end of the call. Those were uh, really fun. So it was fun to take some of those calls and just try to help walk people through, find a fit with H2O or just sometimes just walk them through some maybe mistakes they were doing or things they were, you know, not seeing and see where we could help them. Um, so yeah, that was a lot of fun. Now it's, it's working on some pretty specific problems, um, you know, to the last several years really, but those problems change shape. And so we've seen a lot of the Kaggle style algorithms are in there um, with some of the products we've been able to produce um, the last couple of years. So. I think Sri mentioned this on Twitter. Uh, Auto ML was named after you, Auto Mark Landry. C can you tell me more about that story? Because I wasn't he, a part of the He's not kidding. Story. Yeah, that, that is a coincidence. Um, but uh, yeah, Sri made it seem like it wasn't. So no, he is, uh, yeah, there's this at H2O World, probably 2015, um, yeah, that was where, uh, yeah, the, the, the Steam Dream Team sort of came out in this auto ML idea. Now he means it, and, and coincidentally, Dimitri Largo's initials are deep learning. So, you know, he, he had auto ML and auto DL there. So, um, pure coincidence, um, but yeah, he, he he's, he's not entirely kidding when he says that, but um, no, thankfully, um, you know, Aaron's driven our auto ML product um, to, to to, to be much better since those days. I was, I was originally tasked with the auto ML uh, for a few weeks and then sort of things changed and I'm glad a little bit of it. We have a bit of a silence there that the path I was taking, it was as a data science problem. It's still an interesting track a little bit, but I'm thankful that Dimitri and, and Arno and just, you know, it's great work there on driverless uh, got us through things that I just would not have really thought possible then. So driverless is really cool. And I cannot say that I had that vision back in the, again, late 2015, when the auto ML term sort of comes up. But yeah, he wasn't <laughs> kidding. And I was working on that for a few weeks, uh, a little bit, it was in kind of my court, but I'm thankful that kind of Dimitri got this, uh, what auto DL is and driverless AI as we know it now um, on track, it's awesome. Okay. Is, is this a ritual at S2O, you team up with someone on Kaggle, you smash the leaderboard and then you invite them to join the team or you continue doing that during lunch? Is, is this a ritual that happens at? <laughs> No, I guess, yeah, I have to dispel that one. Um, so no, I'm, I'm fortunate, I guess, I think that uh, I, I, I've, I've met some really great people along the way. And so I, and then it's, it's just a lot of almost coincidence, you know, I, a lot of times when I do these competitions, I want to keep my, my cards close. Like if I have an edge, I'm not going to give that away. I'm not going to just talk about 
about it in some cases. Um, but the one time I did, just all this stuff unfolded. And so, um, you know, meeting SRK, meeting Marios, you know, and just trying to team up with these things. So I think, to me, I guess it's these sort of organic uh, kind of relationships that got created. And eventually, you know, the circumstances changed. You know, we were lucky that, you know, I just happened to, to try and meet up again with Marios in London on a work trip. And that just sort of got his mind going about thinking of joining H2O. And um, so uh, you know, with SRK is, you know, back and forth, but he's always been, you know, in, in, intrigued with that. And so it was great that we could, um, you know, that he was able to join and done a lot of cool NLP stuff. Um, you know, and, and Brandon was just something different. I, I legitimately wanted to meet Brandon, but, you know, I just found like, wow, there's just someone, you know, out there, so close in the Bay Area, and we really could use someone <laughs> like Brandon. And so I said, "Hey, let's meet up." But you know, I mean, we could tell. You know, it's like it would be really nice if you would join. So Brandon was kind of the first of the grandmasters. I don't know if there were grandmaster was a term back then, but uh, if, if so, uh, he certainly beat me to it. Um, but yeah, he was kind of the first that joined. Uh, we had Dimitri join, who I had met, um, fortunately, you know, a little while past. I wasn't the one who got him to join, but it was kind of instrumental, I guess, a little bit in him joining. Um, but uh, yeah, I just met Dimitri at, uh, you know, to talk. So I think, um, but a lot of the, the team ups, I wish we could do a little more, you know, if you really look, you know, at the H2O team ups, I think a lot of those happened really prior to joining um, H2O. So um, you know, SRK and always, always want to get backed into it. You've seen a couple of our team ups uh, since then, but our kind of best work was uh, really before, um, before that. Okay. Now, this is one of the uh, another mysteries from S2, I think, makers going to make. Can you elaborate on that philosophy? Uh, what's it all about? Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the maker culture is one that you know, I was probably you know, worked in, I don't know, let's call it industry. I mean, everything's industry, but, um, you know, and just these sort <laughs> of the, the, the jobs, like the maker culture almost like passed me by. So I've had to sort of learn it on the fly a little bit too. And so I do kind of wear that makers make, you know, makers gonna make um, shirt kind of proudly. Uh, and so, you know, my, my son has one, like literally my son, when he was six years old, my wife made okay. him a mini size makers gonna make. So, um, but the maker culture make, you know, it does, it does make a lot of sense. And I think as data scientists, you know, that, 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 that does come naturally to a lot of, it, it should, you know, I, I was just seeing one of the, one of the Zindi people was saying, you know, what the ways they set up their problems is to some, it, it comes all different ways. They have someone coming at us with a problem. They have a cool data set and they think maybe could solve a different problem or they just think of a data set and what could we solve with this? You know, and you want to free that, that, you know, people to, to think that way. And, and, and just look, you know, it's just, it's just code we're writing. It's not that hard. Um, so, you know, makers going to make, look at the, the, the grand things we can make, but the true, you know, the makers within H2O, certainly. So there's, there's really two sides of this, you know, the, the Arnos, Prithvi's, you know, are just, just amazing people. Um, just, just, it, it, it like is dizzying to sit next to Arno and watch him like debug <laughs> something and flash through all the windows. Just, he's, he's, he's a, phenomenal coder uh, and i'm not for sure and they're almost the opposite i'm a bad coder that just gets lucky enough with r and data table a lot um but yeah arno is is just phenomenal and and just the passion persistence that he has um so you know that that maker thing and and, and that's it exactly in him like look what he has created you know he's created some really great stuff and then in turn you know we can enable other people to make as well so maker's going to make you know take this software use it go make something great um you know that's that's i was it was next to arno when he you know someone was showing us they were doing some legitimate cancer research using h2o's you know uh, deep learning that was arno's really you know first big project with h2o it's amazing. You know, it's, it's really amazing to see this tool you built, someone has gone off and used and made to, you know, make the world better, a better place. So, um, or at least striving to do that. So, you know, that's, that's, to me, that, that's really my interpretation. Sharice probably has a, you know, maybe a different take on that and everyone may have their own kind of take, but, you know, Maker's going to make it just really just, let's free everyone up to use their creativity. Um, you know, some of the things that, that Prithvi has, has done, it's just, you know, uh, flow. I, I still like Flow H2O's um, GUI for for H2O3 is 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 awesome. I really like it, and he just kind of did that as a side project. You know, the driverless AI interface, these things. You know, the, we have some people who are phenomenal, and, and but you know, tireless workers. You know, Prithvi has an immense knowledge of, you know visual elements but the the, the uh you know the, the data backends he's very you know all kind of the reporting systems data warehousing he knows it all he knows um all that kind of stuff so um and same with you know all of us are it, Kaggle helps you study kind of what the latest and greatest is it, it points us to the right direction but um you know in the software world it's not quite always so clear and so you know we have some phenomenal people that really it just comes natural to them and they're free to make so awesome 
Now, uh, this would be the last data science question. If you were to give one best advice to someone who's just starting on Kaggle, feeling completely intimidated, has no clue what to do, what would be your advice? Yeah, I, I, I certainly get past that. So, you know, get past that to me would be just just get a submission in there. You know, make that submission. It depends on really where you're at. You can take that question a few different ways. But um, yeah, the first barrier is thinking Kaggle and being like a Kaggle lurker or something like that that pays attention a little bit. But just just go in there. Just go join one. See what happens. It's so easy. You know, CSVs are nothing fancy. There's a few competitions where you have to work quite hard to get a, a valid submission, but um, so many of them. And if it's a live competition, I find personally that's the most fun yeah. um, but look at the wealth of historical competitions that are out there you know and you can submit to almost all of those too you know you can see where you'd be at with some of those other ones so whatever you kind of take if you're if you're intimidated by a leaderboard and all these people attacking this problem actively then maybe you seek an, an older one or something like that but you know i would really say get an account <laughs> go sign in and you know go go put a submission in you know make it all zeros make it the average you know and just just improve it, it's it's a it's an iterative process to almost all of us. So I was the one meetup I got to attend uh, while I lived down in the Bay Area was uh, Francois Cholet was doing, um, you know, something about, you know, Keras was pretty new at the time, newer, I should say at least. And so, you know, he put some really cool, um, you know, the, the backbone of, of really what he was thinking of and trying to, to, to do this is, is, is common with software in general. We build things on top of things on top of things. And so he says, we've got to free people up so that they can experiment, uh, you know, about 40 times a day, you know, you're running experiments, you know, you'd be as fluid as possible. So uh, there's different, you know, one part of that is this iterative nature. Like, you know, you, you, it is usually not best to go and solve the problem and plan out your full solution. As much as I say, you want this mental model around problems. Um, you don't want to solve the whole thing. You don't want to sit there on the sidelines for most of it and develop this idea. I think I'd want to do this. I think I want to do this. You just go in there and do it. Yeah. And most people will have better results if they can chip away at that problem in bite-sized chunks. So the first thing is get the data in, go submit something really basic and then just iterate from there and see where it takes you. So. Okay. Now, uh, these are a few interesting questions that I, I think I, I'd asked from the AMA. Uh, yeah. no, first one is, what's, what's your favorite sports? It, that one, uh, I played baseball early on, but it's definitely um, later age been American football. So I do like uh, international football, soccer, as we call it here in, in the U.S. Um, uh, quite a bit, but um, but no, American football, it, it, we'll, hopefully we can get uh, some of the player safety things out of the way. Nice things John Miller's doing. Hopefully it will go and help the game. So that's an unfortunate side effect. We're learning a lot more about both footballs, really. But, um, so it's a bit... bit uh, I feel a bit guilty saying that because that's a true, that's a reality, but I um, nonetheless know that the, the sport, the game watching it. Um, yeah. It's, it's uh, Dallas Cowboys have been my favorite team since I lived in Connecticut and uh, yeah, big, pretty big football fan. So. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one. If it could be a superhero, who would it be? Yeah. So this one, um, you know, I, I, I think for me, it could be several, maybe, I mean, I think one of the, 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 the trait of a superhero, I think I would look most forward to would be, something almost simple a little bit, but, you know, flying. So it's been a, a, a thing of mine for a while. So, you know, we could go classic and go Superman or Iron Man or something like that. And not really sure. And, and I'm not even, my superhero knowledge is not that great, but I think, um, you know, it would be exciting to, you know, to, to have the ability to fly, of course, and, you know, Superman could do so many cool things. So why not? We'll go with a I would have said, mundane I, answer there. <laughs> I would have said, I want to be a grandmaster. You're already one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if, it, 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 we're not superheroes, though. So, <laughs> even watching this, you can do it too. So, yeah, it's the passion, the persistence. I think that to keep it through and a lot of time put into it, you can't you can't really ignore that one. So, uh, last one: if you had a time machine that you could take anywhere for one day, where and when would you go? Yeah, that's the toughest one on the AMA. So the, it, it's a hard one, actually. So I think, you know, I mean, this is, a, this is an awful answer, but, you know, I mean, just I like where I'm at. You, you, it's one of these things where I wouldn't really change so much. You know, so many of these, I guess I feel like a lot of, you know, luck has gone into so many things, you know, and, and maybe it would happen a different way or something like that. So um, I think, you know, maybe to, to cite an oddly religious sort of one, I might go back to kind of zero BC times or something like that, um, which is something like that. But, um, you know, I mean, pick an interesting sporting event, but what is that? You're just watching a sporting event. So, um, yeah, I don't have a great, uh, great answer for that. Um, but I think that would be, that would probably be it. So. Okay. Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and thank you for all of your contributions to the community. 
Well, and the same, yeah, it's exciting to, to get these together. So I'm happy to be part of this. And uh, yeah, the, definitely the, the honor is mine on this. Um, so glad I can hopefully can help somebody out. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.